Pentecostal Church, and this is Pastor Ezekiel Johnson. Glad that you can join us this evening, and uh, we're going to get into our Bible study tonight in Acts chapter 11. But before we do that, we want to go to God in prayer. We just want to take some needs to God in prayer, but whenever we do that, we always want to, as the Bible says, enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. So that just means we're going to enter into a time of thanking Him for what He's done. Praise God. And then praising Him for what He's done. You know, the two, difference between the two is one is remembering, recalling those things and mentioning them. And then the other is, of course, uh, calling God names, like I like to say, but good names, uh, based on what He's done. And that's what they did in the Word of God. You know, many, many times when God moved in a certain way in the Old Testament, they then attached that quality or that provision or that thing that God did to His name. And so a praise is really when you're giving God some credit for something that he's done. Praise God. And we want to do that certainly in our, our prayer as we ask him for things that we have need of. Praise God. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we love you tonight. We're so thankful for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for every intervention that you've made, everything that you've done, Lord, in our lives, the blessings that you've brought our way, God, the prayers that you have answered. God, I thank you tonight, God, for what you do, Lord, how you work, how you move, God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We praise your name, God, because we know that you are Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides, God. You're a prayer answering God. You're the one that is able to change situations, Lord, that come before us, God. When we have to depend on you, we need to trust you, Lord God. You're trustworthy, and we're so thankful and so appreciative of the fact that we can put our trust in you our confidence in you. We don't have to lean on our own understanding, depend on our own way of thinking through it, God. But we can trust you and know that you're leading our steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Well, last week we were talking about, in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, the first Gentile that was uh, brought into the church. And uh, we went through his conversion experience. You know, in the Bible, what you'll see is in these conversion experiences, you'll see some very detailed uh, information. When you have a name of a person, a city mentioned, and all the, the trimmings that go along with it, all the other ancillary details. And uh, many times, it, what, we'll, it, what we'll mention also is this very recurring theme, such as they were baptized in the name of Jesus, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, here's something to remember about that. And I want it to be more than just my words, more than just something that I'm saying. But the thing you need to remember about this is that these things were inextricably tied to the experience called becoming a Christian. You see, it wasn't until our day, or, or after the fact, you know, maybe a century or two after the fact, that people begin to question the very elements or the very actions that one took to become a Christian. In so much that today, you know, some, you know, 2,000 um, years removed or 20 centuries removed, you have uh, people looking at the, the very essence of how to become a Christian and stripping away all the other things and just saying all you have to do is just believe. Because there's a misconstruence in terms of that whole process of believing. Believing was encompassing of the entire thing. Being born of water and of spirit. When you believe you did those things. They were inextricably tied to the experience called becoming a Christian. And uh, what the devil has done in our world is he has broken those things apart, separated them, and have people thinking basically that they are saved before they even do any of these things that the Bible requires. Um, so let's go into this. In Acts chapter 10, we see Cornelius. He's a Gentile. and uh, But he, like I said last week, there were some things about Cornelius' experience that were quite unique. Um, he prayed, a devout man, prayed to God always, and to the true God, obviously. Um, and he gave alms. He, he was very generous with what he had to people uh, that were less fortunate. And God saw those things, took note of them, sent an angel to speak to him. 
and he was basically told to send for one Simon, who, uh, whose surname is Peter, that stays in Joppa with Simon the Tanner, and he's going to bring you words whereby you uh, must be saved, or things that you ought to do, is the way he words it. And so, God deals with, and we see this racial component. I, I spoke, spoke about this briefly last week. There's, there's this racial component that is in the, the New Testament church because of the way the Jews thought. You see, many things that the Jews did, uh, they took it to the umph degree, to the extreme. Um, they, they took it to the extreme in the sense that they, uh, they added things to the law more than what was written. They got to the point that they wouldn't even associate with a Gentile, wouldn't eat a meal with them, uh, would hardly speak to them, considered them dogs. Now, that was never something that was told to them in the Old Testament law. If you look at the Old Testament law, there's nothing that indicates that God wanted them to treat people this way. But this is what happens when you have a homogenized society where you're just dealing with just your own kind. And this is what happens when people take the word of God and they add their own righteousness to it. And the Jews had gotten to this place that it was difficult for them to really have dealings with Gentiles. And it was, really wasn't something that God um, had dictated to them or even suggested that they do. It's just something like many other things that just developed over time, habits and customs and, and things that they added to the law. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they had added something to the effect of about 612 partitions to the law, other than what the law stated, things that they added that were extra. And Jesus kind of hit him on some of those things. One time he went through a cornfield on, on the Sabbath day, and, you know, he picked some corn, and they kind of got on him about that because they started to define what work was. If you picked some corn, that was considered work. Uh, if you washed your hands, they had a certain way that you washed your hands, the water had to kind of run down your elbow. You couldn't rub your hands together or it was considered work. They had gotten ridiculous, in other words. And um, that kind of happened. So you see some of this coming out. But there's this whole mentality and it just was what it was. And uh, God had to deal with the Jews. Uh, even Peter, Peter being raised a Jew, had to have God deal with him and let him know that, hey, what I say is clean, don't you call unclean. Because they considered Gentiles unclean, not just the certain animals that they couldn't eat and all those kind of things, but they considered Gentiles, so that's why they didn't associate with them. So here Peter is up on the housetop, and they're cooking a meal down below, and he's up there getting a rest, and he has a vision. And in this vision, he sees a blanket being let down with all types of animals that he's not allowed to eat as a Jew. And he has a voice say, rise, kill, and eat. He says, no, Lord, I've never done that, never will. And it happens three times. And each time that comes down, and it, the voice comes and tells him to rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And then it gives him these instructions. It says, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. And so the vision goes away. And then there's some men at the door knocking. The Spirit of God calls to Peter and says, go with those men asking or doubting nothing. So there's about six brethren, we'll find that out today in chapter 11, there's about six Jewish brethren that are with Peter, that go with him, they accompany him to accompany these men back to Cornelius' house. And of course, we know what happened at Cornelius' house. Peter's preaching, the Holy Ghost falls, and uh, verse, we'll skip down to verse number 43 here. So he's preaching in verse number 43 of chapter 10. <clears throat> Just recap in chapter 10 really quick before we, we slide over into chapter number 11. So in chapter 10 here, verse 43, the Bible says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now here's a, here again, you have just the word believe, and then remission of sins tied with it, no baptism mentioned here. But we know that that is a part of the equation, because the word believe, when he says believe, he automatically assumes that you're going to follow these other things that are inextricably tied to this whole idea of being saved. Back then, they didn't separate them. They didn't break it out. They didn't say this is necessary, that's not necessary. They just took what Jesus said, except the man be born of water and born of spirit, he cannot see to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they just made sure that everybody did those things. 
There wasn't a question about, well, how about if you were to not do that? One of the elements. If you didn't get born of the water, would you still make it? Or if you weren't born of the Spirit, would you still make it? It wasn't those kind of questions. Jesus said, made a statement so you understood what you had to do. I think sometimes we entertain this idea of um, exceptions. And people like to make exceptions to the rules. And you know, But if God says something, I want to do what God says to do. I don't want to look for ways out of it. Because someday I'll stand before him in judgment and I'll have to explain all those things. And I won't have the... the, uh, the the ability to couch my answers and nuances and and uh, make um, deceptive statements or anything like that because God sees right through it. He understands everything I'm about to say. There's nothing hidden from his eyes. And so what we want to do is take the word of God for what it says and obey it. Praise God. That's important. Because if you don't, at some point, you're just picking and choosing what you will and won't do. And we, we have to... The Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy. And I, I want to follow what God's saying to do, not just what my ideas are. Because the Bible says our righteousness, if, it, if you really want to get down to the nitty-gritty of it, our righteousness is as filthy rags. What we think doesn't really matter. What His Word says matters because it's His Word that will eventually judge us at judgment. So we want to make sure that we are aligning with that and not necessarily what some man says. Because people have a lot of opinions but that opinion needs to be tried and true with the Word of God. And there's no way, when it comes to salvation, of trying something that someone says other than with the examples of salvation that are given to us for that very reason. To validate, to give a litmus test, to be able to show that this is in fact the right way that it's to be done. <clears throat> so, in Acts chapter 40, um, 10 and verse number 43, he says... Um, <clears throat> To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever shall believe in him shall receive remission of sins. While he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word. How do they know? Verse number 45 says, And they of the circumcision which believe, these are these six men that came with Peter, as many as came with Peter, be, um, <clears throat> they were astonished. This is the word they use, astonished. It means shocked. I mean like mouth open, shocked. Eyes wide, shocked. As many as came to Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's how they knew. There's one item here that, I mean, it's beyond anybody doubting. It's beyond anybody being able to question it, because it's the way it's written. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That is the way they knew that they had received the Holy Ghost. And then Peter's answer, his response rather, in verse number 47 is, Can any man forbid water? Why water? Well, he just said that he spoke of remission of sins and that he believed. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized, the same shall be saved. So, <clears throat> here Peter sees these people receive the Spirit of God, they're born of the Spirit, and now he's, t he's basically remarking to the other Jews that are with him, can any of you guys forbid water? The other thing that accompanies spirit baptism is water baptism. Can any of you guys give me a reason why these people that have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, that is a very important phrase, as well as we, because now it's a comparative phrase. What is it being compared to? If, there's, if he's saying as well as we, when did the we here receive the Holy Ghost? On the day of Pentecost. The Bible lets us know they were in the upper room, and uh, suddenly the Spirit fell, and they all began to speak with tongues and magnify God. So that same experience, as he says in verse number 40, as Luke says here in verse number 46, uh, for they heard them speak with tongues, that same experience is matched and that is the, that's the quintessential piece that lets them know that they have, in fact, received the same exact gift as they have. And so that's why Peter says, who can forbid water these should be baptized, that it have received as well as we. And so in verse number 48, he commands that they be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they pray for them to tarry there several days with them. But after this event, there are some people that are not at this event that get word of this event 
and they are upset about it. And they are the Jews that are in Jerusalem. Now, there was Jews in Jerusalem that hadn't got the memo. They didn't know that you were supposed to, uh, that, the, that the Gentiles were accepted now. And they were pretty upset about this. And basically, they called Peter on the carpet. And Peter had to explain himself. And so, ver chapter number 11 starts off with Peter basically explaining himself. And he's going to recount some of these things that take place in this chapter. But here's basically what happened. So, in, he starts off here in verse number 1. And the apostles and brethren that were, in, that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Uh, and when Peter was come to Jerusalem... They that were of the circumcision contended with him. Let me go back to verse number one. Listen, I, I want to bring this point out. This is important. If you're writing something and there is some redundancy in what you're writing, in other words, you're stating the same thing or recounting the same experience, quite naturally, you're going to use different words to phrase that. Uh, at some point, you're going to sum it up in generalities. You're going to use general terms. We do this when we use a person's name. Rather than just saying, Mike, 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 throughout the whole piece, you'd say he. And you'd use pronouns to basically describe that same individual. And just so the, the reading has some, some fluidity to it. And this is the same thing that happens here in the book of, of uh, the book of Acts. You know, that's why you're not going to get every single time, everything that takes place, as far as baptism, Jesus' name, filled the Holy Ghost, they're not going to mention that every single time. Case in point, verse number one, let me show you. Just kind of a brief example of that. And, uh, and, and the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that, the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now, receive the word of God is a catch-all phrase for they were baptized in his name and filled with his spirit. Because that's what took place. But rather than saying that, rather than mentioning that, in the, like he just had done in the previous chapter, Luke doesn't say all that. He just simply cat, um, summarizes that, that, um, that, uh, that understanding with this phrase received the word of God. And it's understood what he's saying, that they had done those very things, because you can go back in the previous chapter and see exactly how they received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. There was a striving. There was an argument. They were just like, and here's, what, here's their argument, verse number three, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and you ate with them? You ate with people that were uncircumcised? You see, the mentality of somebody that was a Jew back then, uh, they, you know, a strict Jew, they felt that you shouldn't even socialize with a Gentile. That was strictly forbidden within their circles. A colloquial stance, not necessarily a biblical one that I could see, um, but it, it was a, a colloquial stance that they just kind of had an understanding of that. But Peter rehearsed the matter, verse number 4, from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them. In other words, he went back to the beginning and just kind of told the story as it unfolded. He says, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even unto me. So he recounts this whole story about this, this sheet coming down and, you know, the whole... Uh, clean and unclean, and what I call clean, don't you call unclean, the whole thing. And really the rationale that the Spirit gave him to go with these men, preceding their arrival. And so he just wanted to let them know that it just wasn't something that I just wanted to do. This is something that God was definitely in. And uh, it's kind of hard to argue with that. And upon, um, he, he lets them know that he also goes with the men, uh, to, to Caesarea. And uh, when he got there, the Bible says in verse number 15, Peter lets him know that as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the very beginning. See, he hearkens back to that same thing. The way that he qualifies, the way that he excuses, the way that he, uh, he, he, he actually uh, states that these people with, with some kind of certitude that they've received the same, that they received the Holy Ghost, is that he compares it to what happened on the day of Pentecost. He's making the comparison in Jerusalem, mind you, 
with Jews that were there on the day of Pentecost and saying to them that what happened to us happened to these people. And so, you know, when I get the question, well, does everybody speak in tongues when they get the Holy Ghost? Well, if they had done anything different, then it would have been a disqualifier. <clears throat> they would not have accepted these people so readily. If anything else other than speaking in tongues had taken place, they would never have had this discussion. I mean, they would never have given Peter the floor like this because they would, they would say there's a distinction, there's a difference between what took place with us and them. But that's not what's going on here. As what was stated uh, by Luke in chapter 10, when the men that came with Peter saw that the Holy Ghost, that the people that received it at Cornelius' house, was just like what they received on the day of Pentecost themselves, they were shocked. They were amazed. They didn't doubt it. They saw what was taking place. So now he's recounting it to these people, the men in Jerusalem <clears throat> of the circumcision that were saved, that still didn't get the revelation that you didn't really need to be circumcised, you didn't need to hold, the, hold to the ceremonial things of the law. <clears throat> They didn't understand, but here Peter is helping them understand by saying it's the same gift. It's the same thing that took place with us is what takes place with them. And who was I to withstand God? And he says, then I remember what God, what, what the word of the Lord was, how he said that John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. There was a distinction. The Holy Ghost was going to take place. It was going to come. And it was, going to, it was going to be that thing that God was going to pour out. For as much then, as in verse number 17 says, for as much then as God gave them the like gift. See, here's the thing. The like gift. Uh, a lot of people like to say that the gift of the Holy Ghost is going to be one of the fruits, one of the gifts of the Spirit. It could be anything. Because they go to 1 Corinthians, which was written to the church at 1 Corinthians, or the church at Corinth, Corinth rather. 1 Corinthians was written to the church at Corinth. And so this is already an established church that are getting maturity. He's giving them second level information, not entry level information. This is second level information. These are people that already have the Holy Ghost, already have been using the gifts, and now he's giving them instructions on how to do that properly. So it's, it's not the same thing as a new person just coming to God. So every time in the book of Acts when someone receives the Holy Ghost, you see them always, when it talks about what they do, they speak in tongues. And as a matter of fact, in these comparative scriptures where they're comparing, like in this case, Gentiles receiving the Holy Ghost, who they did not think it was possible that they could, the way that they knew they had it is they did, the Gentiles did the same exact thing that they did. So there was a comparison to the beginning. And that's what Peter is using as his defense argument to the, to the, uh, the, men, the brethren that are basically contending with him as to, you know, basically saying, why did you do this? By what grounds? And so you have that dynamic at play here. And uh, Peter is, of course, letting them know that this is the very same thing that took place with us is what happens with them. When he heard these things they held their peace and they glorified God saying that God hath also given to the Gentiles repentance unto life now here's another thing repentance unto life another way of phrasing it I, I, what, I, what I'm bringing out tonight is that there's this whole uh, colloquial speak um, you know within, within these circles these Christian circles that the Bible is written with and so you cannot take another meaning from that other than what is demonstrated. So when they say here um, in verse number 18, when they heard these things that Peter talked about, they held their peace and glorified God, saying that, that God has also given to the Gentiles, granted to the Gentiles, repentance unto life. So the whole salvation is they term it as repentance unto life. And now, one person can take that and run with that and say, oh, all you have to do is repent. No, it doesn't say that. The actions that are summarized by the statement are the same actions that you must do and I must do. We, just, we can't take the Word of God and parse it out like that because we, we end up harming ourselves. When you parse something out or you take like the, 
the summarized statement or the general statement, and you try to break that statement down independent of the actions that it represents, that becomes a problem. So we have to be accurate. And it's not rocket science here. It's just simply following the examples that are listed and, and letting that be the standard by which we determine what we must do for salvation. So verse number 20, and some of them were men of, um, and so verse number 19 rather, now they which were scattered abroad um, upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but only to the Jews. So, you know, what had taken place, the Jews that were in Jerusalem, they went and they spread the gospel in all these other different cities of the countries, but only to the Jewish population there because they, once again, were of the mentality that it was just for Jews. And some of the men were of Cyprus, and he mentions Cyprus and Cyrene, and which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So uh, this word is getting spread, and people are taking it. And so Antioch becomes the first place that they're called Christians. And the Bible says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Once again, a phrase that is not explicit in terms of stating that they uh, repented of their sins, were baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. However, the summarizing statement says that they, they believed and then they turned to the Lord. But it doesn't define what turning to the Lord or believe actually is. That has been previously defined. So therefore, in writing this in a narrative state, uh, um, uh, way, status, or narrative style that Luke is employed in writing this, he's using these summarizing general statements at times like we would if we were writing the story to, uh, to basically explain or to, uh, to encapsulate a experience rather than redundantly stating it over and over and over again spelled out. That would be natural writing. You wouldn't write it that way by every time you want to say it with all the detail. You would find a way at some point to generally summarize the statement, you know, what you're, you're talking about. This is the way anybody writes, uh, even legal documents where they try to, you know, be as specific and explicit as possible. They still end up doing this because nobody wants to be over redundant in what you're doing because it just it loses its effectiveness. Verse number 22 says, Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, and who when he was come had seen the grace of God. Now here's another phrase. Now tonight, I'm, yes, I am jumping on these phrases because when, when, when Paul writes, he uses some of these phrases, you know, and uh, he's doing some general... Uh, recapping and, and, and stating of, of what they've already done, but you don't have to tell the church about these things in explicit detail when they've already done it, when they've already been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't have to always state it like that. And so he does it in his writing. But here's, here's a phrase. So in, in verse number, um, in verse number um, let's see here, 21, the Bible says that and the hand of the Lord, uh, verse number, let's see here, I guess it would be verse number 23, speaks about Barnabas going down to Antioch. So when Barnabas goes down to Antioch, the Bible says, who when he came and had seen the grace of God. Now what's that talking about? People that, that were baptized, built the Holy Ghost, and now are part of the church. The phrase, he saw the grace of God, was that. He comes down, he was glad when he saw the grace of God and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. So he comes down and sees that a number of people have now, you know, accepted this thing, have been baptized, filled with his spirit. We assume this because of other places where they were, it's actually explicitly detailed what they did, that's what took place. So when he looks at a group of people that the Bible says they received the word and they turned to the Lord, and he comes down and sees them, and it's phrased by Luke here as him seeing the grace of God. These people that are converted. 
we know what their conversion experience would be. It's just this phrase is a catch-all, so you're not redundantly repeating the same things over and over and over again. But there's these, this catch-all phrase is basically inclusive of that. The reason I, I point this particular one out, because in Ephesians, when Paul writes in Ephesians 2.8, he says, For by grace are you saved, in that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Um, you know, for actually, he says, For by grace are you saved, through faith. Um, and, you know, so what he's, what he's basically saying is that grace is the act that, of, of self, the act that God did. You can't take that separately and say it's something you have nothing to do with. You have no actions in this. He's not saying that. Paul's not coming against what was, you know, Luke and what Paul writes has got to mesh. It needs to be, you know, um, it needs to, needs to back each other up, not contradict each other. And it can't start something new. Romans cannot be a book that we find the plan of salvation in, and we can't find it in the book of Acts. That makes no sense. Romans was written 25 years after the book of Acts, or after the church started. God certainly would not wait 25 years after the church starts to then tell you how to be saved in that Romans 10.9. Sometimes the things that are understood or taught are preposterous, and that being one of them. If you go to Romans 10, 9 and say, this is the plan of salvation, this is the way to be saved, then you completely have missed the boat because it's not going to, go, it's not going to be mentioned there first and mentioned nowhere else prior to that time. Paul wrote the book of Romans right about in Acts, between Acts 18 and Acts 20. When he was in Corinth. So he wrote that book way back then. Or way at that point rather in the uh, history of the church. The church had well been established. So verse number 24 says. And this speaking of, uh, of Barnabas. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. And of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Now once again. Without going into detail about what they did for their salvation, it just simply says much people were added to the Lord. Now, if we look on the day of Pentecost, that phrase, you know, that were added to the church in verse number forty-one of Acts chapter two, the Bible says that um, that it, um, when Paul goes back, he's, the Bible says, and as many as received the word were baptized. Praise God. And such, um, and uh, about 3,000 souls were added to them that day. So the adding of souls to the church happens when water and spirit birth take place. I mean, one thing we cannot separate, uh, baptism is the water birth. Um, and of course, receiving the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking tongues, is the spirit birth. And so those things precede a person being added to the church, to their number. And so that's the way it went here. So we understand when he uses that general term, we understand that it's encompassing of those actions taking place in their life. Then Barnabas, then departed rather, verse number 25, Barnabas to Tarshish. Now this is where Saul's from, to seek Paul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that for a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So you have a dynamic in the church where uh, they are first, you know, because the doctrine is being um, really disseminated there among the people. Um, and not just Jews. But the doctrine is being disseminated among the people there. And uh, this is where that term Christians or Christianity first uh, takes root or is first labeled on uh, Christians in the city of Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there would be a great dearth or drought throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So 
it's a documented thing here where there's a prophecy that goes forth and a very specific prophecy. God's saying that, you know, there's going to be a, a, a worldwide uh, famine. And uh, that does take place. And God does these things. God warns his people. God, God's always speaking. God's looking for a vessel that wants to be used of God. God's looking for somebody that wants to say, that says, God, I'm here to be used. I want to be a vessel for you to use me in some capacity. He says, choose ye the best gifts. And of course, Agabus was a prophet. This is the first, this is perhaps the first time we see him prophesying, but certainly not the last in the book of Acts. There'll be another, another time that he'll be given a prophecy in a, in, a, in a very demonstrative way as well. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And of course, here Saul still has that name, still has still using his, uh, his Jewish name, Saul, and uh, that's going to eventually change um, to Paul, which is going to be his Roman name. So praise God. Moving on to chapter number 12. Now, whenever the Word of God is, is uh, starting to take root, and there's a time of peace, and we know that after Paul had gone to, uh, to, uh, to, to Tarshish, um, the church had rest, the Bible lets us know in, in chapter 9. For a little bit they had some peace, they had some rest. And uh, of course then the story of Ananias, the first, or not Ananias, but Cornelius, the first Gentile being saved is brought into the picture in chapter 10 and 11. It's recounted in, um, in Jerusalem by Paul, to the, or by Peter rather, to the, to the Jewish authority, to the church authority rather. And then in, verse number, in chapter number 12, you see the devil raise his head back up. He's trying to squash this thing. He wants to, it, it's not his desire that the church spread out and, you know, more people get saved. He's trying to squash this thing. And so he uses the authority of the powers that be, the state. And he often does this. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan will affect people in leadership, in government, and those kind of things, to inflict harm on his people. And this is what happened. In verse number 1 of chapter 12, it says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. In other words, he wanted to make life miserable and to harm the church. And this is how he did it. And he killed James, the brother of John with the sword. So he takes one of the apostles and he kills him, beheads him. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So it was a, a feast, a Jewish feast. And Peter was spared during that feast time and it wasn't going to take place. He knew that he couldn't kill somebody during the feast time. So Peter's life was spared during this time. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quad, quad, um, quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing. This is powerful. The church had just lost James. King came down, captured James. James is beheaded or killed. And there's sadness. I mean, this hasn't happened in some time. Somebody that high up in their ranks is now dead, uh, killed, martyred. And uh, it's during the Passover time. And... Peter is thrown in jail until the Passover is over. And the Bible says that the church began to pray without ceasing. In other words, I guess they had a prayer chain going on. This was serious. They saw what happened to James. They did not want to lose Peter. They started, they started praying. And they started praying. And they started praying. And the Bible says, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, verse number 6, 
Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the doors kept the prison. In other words, there were two guards that were sleeping with him, chained to him. They were going to make sure he wasn't going anywhere. Perhaps they heard the stories of what had taken place previously when, uh, when, uh, when Peter was in other, other, uh, when other ones, when they were chained up and how God had delivered them from prisons. Earlier we, we, uh, we had some of those things take place. And, and perhaps that was going through their minds at the time. And they were going to make sure it didn't happen again. So they had guards and chains and they had them bound pretty, pretty tightly. And behold, the angel of the Lord came and shined a light in the prison and smote Peter on, this, on the uh, side and raised him up saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said, Gird thyself, and bind thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. In other words, put your coat on, let's go. And he went out and followed him, and wist not, he knew not, that it was true, which was done. But he thought he was in a vision. He thought he was just seeing something. He couldn't believe what was taking place. Uh, he was probably half asleep. And when they went past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate which leads to the city, which opened of its own accord. 20th century technology got employed there. The gate just opens for them. And Peter went out and passed through onto the street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, woke up, realized what was going on, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent an angel. And hath delivered me out of the hands of Herod. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. They wanted to see him dead, but God had other plans. God had delivered him. Uh, and so, the Bible says that prayer was made without ceasing. But here's the thing about this, you know. Sometimes we think of some people out in the Bible as being these bastions of faith. And uh, having, you know, these... Uh, you know, almost like a Superman kind of exterior and, and faith and unwavered and no doubting whatsoever and those kind of things. Well, the Bible just says that they pray without ceasing. But then when we get to look at this story a little more closely, we can see that they probably didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, think about this. It just, what had taken place with James? He died. And here's Peter caught up in the same situation and it looked like he was going to die. They were praying, nonetheless, they were praying. Um, and the Bible says that Peter, when he came to himself, he then went, um, he went in verse number 12, and he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. They were having a prayer meeting at this particular house at that time, and he shows up and knocks on the door. And Peter knocked on the door at the gate, and a damsel came to uh, to hearken, um, named Rhoda. And when she saw, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. She was excited, but ran in and told them how Peter stood at the gate. Now look at their reaction to what to what she's telling them. They're praying for this to happen, right? They're praying. I guess you know God spares life. Uh, God released him. I, I don't know exactly what their imagination was allowing them to pray. Yes, I said imagination. Because what happens when you pray in faith, you're imagining what you want. And you're talking to God from your imagination, what you're wanting to see happen. Praise God. So I don't know what they were really imagining, but here they're praying for God to spare them at least, and not really, um, you know, figuring out the details of all that. And the Bible says that they looked at her and they said, you're crazy. You're mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, it is, it's his angel, it's his spirit. You know, it, it's, it's amazing. These people are in a prayer meeting praying that God would, would deliver Peter, I guess. I guess they were praying that God would deliver him. I, I don't know what they imagined could take place or what they imagined would be taking place or what they were praying for exactly. But the Bible says prayer was being made, so we know where their hearts were. They were like, God, don't let them die, maybe. Maybe that's all they were saying. But here God has 
miraculously delivered and, and you know Peter and and he's now there and and they're having the hardest time believing that God actually did this it's amazing it's amazing but we're human we're, we're like this you know we we can sometimes exhibit the the greatest amount of faith and at other times it's like we have you know uh, amazing doubt it's like Jesus looking at Peter and saying you know, when Peter, he says, who do, men say, who do you say that I am? He says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, Bar, Bar, Simon Bar Jonah, blessed are you um, among men. This has not um, been revealed to you, not of your flesh and blood, but of my Father which is in heaven. He gives them this high compliment saying, you're hearing, you know, from God. This is, this is divine in nature in terms of what this knowledge that you have here, this revelation that you have. And then just not a few short verses after that, Jesus is telling his disciples how he's going to be crucified, how he's going to suffer many things. And Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. That's not going to happen to you. We're not going to let that happen to you. And Jesus turns to him. It sounds just like a thing of concern. Peter just loving him so much that he doesn't want that to happen. And Jesus turns to him and says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, but, but the things of men. Just that quick. And so we, we as human beings, we are fickle in that we, our emotions can swing. And sometimes, you know, we can, we can have great faith and sometimes we can exhibit some incredible doubt. And that's what kind of goes on here for a second. But they finally open up. Peter continued to knock continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw it was him. And here's that word, astonished. They were shocked and with amazement. But he beckoned unto them with the hand and to hold their peace and declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things to James and to the brethren. Um, and he departed and went to another place. So here, God works a miracle. God... Uh, works a miracle and frees him from prison. And uh, one person dies, another one is spared. God is a sovereign God. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes we don't understand that. Sometimes we lose people that we were praying that God would save them. Sometimes we lose people that we were praying that God would heal them. But it, it doesn't always work the way that we think. God doesn't always move the way we think He should move. But praise be to God. They have something here. You know, it's, it's, it's that irony. And this is the thing we have to come to grips with. Because if you're not careful, you can get to the place that you get crossways with God because you don't understand Him. I mean, James. He has a brother named John. John's lost his brother James. Killed by Herod. But then his friend Peter is spared. And you, you know, you got these two dynamics here. One person is, is spared, another one's uh, dead. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're not going to always understand, it's not going to always make sense when we bury a, a 13 year old girl. It's not going to make sense that we prayed for God to heal her. But her life wasn't spared. She was taken. But here's the thing. doesn't matter. We're not on the throne. We're not God. We're not the one. We're living this life. There's going to be a lot of things in life that we cannot explain. We do not understand. We, we, don't, we don't know the metric that God is using to evaluate uh, what decision he makes. And you know what? It's not my business to know. What I need to... You know, that's why the Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. But that's the most difficult thing. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a phrase that almost kind of rolls off the tongue because we know it so well. Proverbs 3, 5. But at the same time, it is not easily done. Think about this. I mean, you know, some prayers we get, we pray, and the answer comes. And there's other prayers we pray, and disappointment comes. 
But here's what he says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. If you reserve that little part back of doubt and unbelief, that can, be, that can spell the beginning of the end because the devil can take that toehold and blow that thing up. But he says, he says, in all of your ways, acknowledge it. He says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding. But in all of your ways, acknowledge it. Put it all before him. Lay it out before him. And he'll direct your paths. I, there's, there's just going to be times that a James dies and a Peter lives. And we have to come to grips with that. We have to come to grips. There's going to be some prayers that you pray that you earnestly want answered and they don't get answered like you want them answered. Is that time to just burn a towel and say, well, you know, I give up on God. Not by a long shot. Because you know what happens? Life continues to go on. And you are still a part of life. And your journey is not over. Your journey is not finished. There's, there's a road yet for you to go. This is just a part of your journey. The good and the bad. The ebb and flow of life. But we have to understand that we're responsible to God. God made us. We're His children. And it's God that ultimately is going to get the glory out of our lives. It's God ultimately that's going to work in us to get the glory out of our lives. So here, God now deals with Herod. Now, as soon as it was, in verse number 18, now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stirring among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter, because he escaped. And so somebody had to be, you know, held responsible. In verse number 19, and when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers. In other words, they questioned these guys and commanded that they should be put to death. So the guys that allowed Peter to escape, really, you know, the angel rescued him, but all those soldiers actually got put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. In verse number 20, now here's, a, this is New Testament. This is somebody who's not in church. This is a, a, a ruler, a leader. But watch what happens here. It's almost like an Old Testament kind of event that takes place here. In verse number 20, the Bible says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, those are two cities, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon, uh, and on a, and upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in his royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. In other words, he made a speech. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of God, and not of a man. And immediately, the Bible says, in verse number 23, the angel of the Lord smote him. In other words, a disease or a sickness. Because he gave not God the glory. Now, he was not even a Jew. He was... Uh, he was more likely a Greek and that, that Herod or that the Roman authority had set up there to basically be rulers over the, the Jews. But he had killed James. Somehow, and in this situation, he's making a speech, getting glory, getting praise for himself, and the angel of the Lord smites him. This, is a, this has always been a strange scripture to me in the book of, of, of Acts because... You know, it's like, this is almost like an Old Testament king that God would do this to because he's taking God's glory and God's praise away. But this happens to Herod. Um, and the Bible says, and he was eaten of worms and he gave up the ghost. That's a pretty gruesome sight. But the angel comes down and smites him because he gave not God the glory. They were saying that he's like a god. And this isn't even a Jewish city. Tyre and Sidon. And, uh, but anyway, he's not giving the uh, praise, the glory to God, and the angel comes and smites him. But the uh, word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, where they had fulfilled their ministry, and took John, whose surname was Mark. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to end this tonight, but I just want to end this in prayer.
as we're closing out tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your goodness. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, for how it was written. We thank you for the book of Acts, God, where you give us examples, God, of salvation. You show us the goings on in the early church, God. You give us an understanding of how you worked and how you're working even today because you said that you don't change. Yesterday, today, and forever, you're still the same. And God, we need the same thing that they had back then because once it started, once you died, and once you, you rose from the dead, Lord, and poured out your spirit, you're still doing that today. And we're so thankful and appreciative of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. God bless you.